So maybe introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about what you do and what your interests are. Okay. Awesome. Do I, do I look at camera one, uh, camera two? Camera, camera two. two just hangs out there doing Hangs out there, all right. Jams. So hi, I'm Daniel Jose Gastan Villanunez. I'm assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology at the New School for Social Research. And I'm assistant director of clinical training in the clinical PhD program, as well as director of the Franz Fanon Lab for Intersectional Psychology. A lot of my work focuses on liberation psychology, critical race theory, and decolonial perspectives on mental health and issues of race and identity more broadly. Did you get interested in Freud and then decide to go into analytic training? Is that the trajectory that it took? Oh, well, for that, we must go back to my mother. It's okay. a very long story of childhood. Uh, no, in all, in all seriousness, I, I got into psychology, well, I kind of saw psychology and psychoanalysis as the same thing when yeah. I was a kid. Um, I grew up in a church where the, the three pastors, there was a head pastor, a youth pastor, and a business pastor, and they all had some level of kind of exposure to psychoanalytic ideas through their seminary training. And my mom was a secretary for the church and for the pastor, so she would always bring back all these books on psychology, diagnosis, psychoanalysis, <laughs> and she would, um, she would read them to me and tell me about the ideas in them, which would make for very interesting bedtime stories. So she would like, you know, psychoanalyze Puerto Rican politics, me, our family, our, our people in our church. And it just got me interested, you know, like she had maybe like an eighth grade education, but she always had the, the, this desire to become a forensic psychologist. So in some ways, it's like she was trying to, you know, live through me a little bit, like pass on that dream of becoming a psychologist. And then of course I go to school and I, you know, learn different things and start teasing apart that psychology is not the same as psychoanalysis. There's a whole range of fields from experimental, developmental, you know, including clinical, uh, but those clearly being separate and different. So I was kind of always in that way, you know, into Freud. And then I came stateside and the story that I then got exposed to was, you know, Freud is just kind of old news, you know, old, bad European white man, he has nothing to offer. And, uh, you know, I very much took to that story at the time, but because of the things I was interested in studying, like around colonialism, racism, etc., in a very circuitous way, it all not only brought me back to Freud, but it led me to really rethink who Freud was in a more complex way not in the way that whitewashes or cleans up the things he did and said that were problematic, but that makes room for a more complex reading of Freud and the ways in which, to kind of sum it up, that he gave us like a really powerful set of tools, not just for understanding like individual psychology, but for understanding society and political systems. And at the same time, he did some pretty bad stuff that kind of enacted those very same problems where you could almost read him as a, um, you know, as a Jewish man in an anti-Semitic world, both trying to understand how it is that people come to hate each other and how it is people collectively come to hate each other, while at the same time wanting to be kind of the quintessential European white scientist. So both identifying with his background, with his identity, even identifying with marginalized people, while also wanting to no longer be marginal by becoming like the powerful, right? So that for me is a more complex and more interesting story than just Freud is all bad or Freud is all good, which also isn't accurate. The desire to sort of be that person, that prototypical, successful, integrated in society person that yeah. Freud also seemed to want of, that's such a hard desire to upend, no matter who you are. I can't imagine, because of the world we live in, how you would be able to see any way out but in yeah. and through and then gain power. If the system didn't depend on that, it wouldn't have the, the power that it has over us, right? So I'll start from like a kind of a clinical place and then I'll tie it kind of to the macro, you know, political place. Like, I work with, for example, um, you know, people of color who come to therapy and 
they might talk about dealing with you know racism in their community or at school or at work whatever it might be and we might talk about and process you know all the ways it impacts their lives and how they cope with it etc and then the following might happen and particularly with non-black people of color also with you know black patients as well but i notice it more with non-black people of color where at a certain point they may start to articulate the fact that because they are not black, they kind of, they sort of know that they're treated differently compared to say their, you know, black friends, colleagues, peers, even partners. And that in some ways they may want to, um, you know, they may like genuinely want to help and support say like Black Lives Matter and create situations where there's greater racial equality, um, but then have this fear that if things get better for black people, then that necessarily means that they have to get worse for them. I've heard it in some variety across communities. If things get better for whoever I perceive as like below me, then that means that's gotta pull me down in some way so that I can't keep climbing up to the next rung and succeed and do well and, and all those things. And at a certain point, I might you know, raise with um, my client you know, you know, it's interesting that you've told me about all these different ways you've experienced racism, and at the same time, you also experience racism towards X group, whether it's, you know, an immigrant population, whether it's um, African Americans, etc. And just wondering aloud, like, how do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of the fact that, on the one hand, you don't want to catch it, right? Like, you don't want to catch this kind of uh, racialized violence, but then the sense that, if, if you want to move up, then that means other people have to be pushed down. And that in order to succeed in our society, then necessarily you have to kind of, you know, almost climb over other people or, or push other people down, right? It's this kind of zero sum game. And that logic keeps us trapped in the logic of this system. It makes it really difficult to actually come together to solve problems collectively because of this en entrenched logic. So in a clinical context, much like a political one, the goal would be, uh, is there a way of seeing how actually the thing that is impacting me is also impacting this other person or group? And that to the extent that we can see that our survival is intimately bound up with the survival and well-being of other people and other groups, then we can come together to address problems collectively, where we can create a world, or we can at least imagine a world, where none of us has to be left at the mercy of precarity. Nobody has to be left at the, the bottom of some hierarchy. Maybe we don't need those kind of extreme hierarchies and can make sure that everybody's taken care of, right? Now that's scary because when you're attached to a given mode of hierarchy, and when you're attached to a given place on that hierarchy, the idea of letting that go is terrifying because the fear becomes, if I let this go, I'm just gonna slip all the way back down to the bottom. And what we're trying to articulate, uh, a number of us, both clinically as well as politically, is that if we can imagine a world where there is no, there's no heights to climb up to, there's no bottom to fall into, but where we can all be taken care of, then maybe we can let go of this world in order to dream and enact a new one. So when you're working with someone who's expressing that anxiety, yeah. what becomes the sort of clinical management of that problem? This might be too abstract. No, no, I think I, think I hear where, where your question is going. I mean, let me um, pull back to something non-political so yeah. that I can then kind of, kind of yeah. explain how, how it would work. So in general, something that leads people to like struggle with you know, mental health issues, relationship issues, problems at work, whatever, um, oftentimes is tied to some fundamental avoidance of some kind. Like in the psychoanalytic world, we talk about defenses. In the cognitive behavioral world, we might talk about experiential avoidance. Like people may avoid um, painful experiences. Like for example, you know, I wanna connect with someone and find intimacy, but I'm afraid that if I try to get too close, they'll leave me, they'll reject me. And so I, you know, maybe I leave them before they leave me, or maybe I, you know, pull back a little bit because being vulnerable is really scary. 
right? There's something about that avoidance that's protective, right? That keeps the person from harm. But at the same time, it can also keep them from the thing they actually want, which is the closeness and the relationship, right? And at a certain point in treatment, you not only communicate, you know, given the context, it makes sense why you have this fear, but look at all these things that the fear is keeping you from. To what extent would it be worth to explore a different, not only a different set of behaviors, but a different possibility that actually maybe if somebody, you know, really got to know you, they would actually realize, oh, this is a person that I wanna get close to, right? So it's that kind of uh, dialectic, but um, tss, between, you know, acceptance and change. Now, how do I relate that to this question of um, political change or the ambivalence about, in a sense, to use this jargon, like let go of one's privilege or want to like make changes in an institution or society that will benefit all of us. It's kind of a similar thing. When you live in a world like ours, where the logic is, you know, work really hard, the, the harder you work, the more you'll be rewarded, you'll get to keep moving up, even if other people are pulled down, right? Um, well, the more you get into that logic, well, the more stressed out you get, because there's no place that you can reach to where that fear that you're gonna slip back down goes away, right? Like the fear of somebody who is kind of scrambling to try to make sure that they have enough for themselves and their family is not the same fear as somebody who is middle upper class and is able to get all the food that they need, and yet they are anxious as if they didn't have those resources, as if they could lose all those resources tomorrow, right? So it's, it's totally different social positions, but they wind up having this shared anxiety because of the society that we live in, right? And so in a, in a clinical sense, it might be talking through with someone. Let's, let's say to go to my, back to my earlier example, somebody who relates to me the ways that they suffer from racism, but they also might be racist to other people. Um, it might be talking about how this helps them. What purpose does it serve in their life? Does this somehow feed into precisely the kind of racism they themselves are experiencing? So then we have to talk about, well, could there be a different way um, in whatever context they're in, a different way of relating to people where it doesn't have to be if others move up, that means I move down, but that there's something about being in solidarity with another that's not just helpful for them, but it'll be helpful for you too. So if people of color were to come together to address issues of racism in a given institution, as opposed to being pitted against each other in some way, then that would be much more likely to lead to change and to have a sense of collective action that would make us depend more on each other than depend on protecting our place in a hierarchy. And this is something that more often than not winds up being more salubrious, I would argue, not just in the political context, but in a clinical context as well, that we don't have to fear one another, that we can actually find our future and our survival by depending on one another collectively. Is that fear that you're talking about, is that just sort of being more comfortable being able to split, right? right? Isn't that, is that what's psychologically, structurally at yeah, play I'm, in that instance? Yeah, totally. I mean, if we, if we think about it in those kind of psychoanalytic terms, it's, it's, it's definitely yeah. splitting. Yeah, yeah. If you're cognitive behavioral, you can think yeah. of black and white thinking and whatever, but it's like these basic, you know, psychological processes yeah. that, you know, lo and behold, get activated when we feel threatened. Uh, if you think about it in attachment terms, you can feel threatened by the idea that you'll lose the object, right? Like some caregiver, you'll lose a relationship, right? That's threatening. This person that I care about and that I want to be with might disappear, etc. But there's another kind of threat that um, we could call broadly status threat, which is the threat that I'm gonna either lose my position or I'm gonna be kept down in some other position. And when you're hit with that, that's also gonna not only trigger all those different avoidance mechanisms that one can talk about, like defenses or cognitive distortions, whatever, but splitting in particular is so, it's so accessible to that kind of stuff, whether it's losing a relationship or losing your status, because it's so intrinsic to the self, right? Like, who are you? Like, it's one thing if, 
you know, Bob doesn't like you. It's a whole other order of business when a whole community or society, it's not just that they don't like you, but are they able to see you as a full human being who deserves to be taken care of, who deserves to have certain basic rights, who deserves to have housing, et cetera. And when we say in this very arbitrary way, these people over here, they should have things, these people over there, they shouldn't. And then you rationalize it by saying it's because they don't work hard or they're culturally deficient. Then that's just rationalizing what's a fundamental split in our sense of reality and who's human and who's not.